Hello, welcome to today's webinar on Effective Oracle eBusiness Suite Change Management from DBA to Auditor. My name is Phil Ryman. I'll be the moderator for this e-learning session. Our speakers today are Mr. Jeffrey Hare and Mr. Stephen Coast. Jeff Hare is a founder and CEO of ERP Risk Advisors. His background includes public accounting, including working for the Big Four, and consulting on Oracle applications. Jeff has been working with Oracle applications since 1998 and has experience in the implementation, upgrading, and supporting these apps. Jeff is a certified public accountant, a certified information systems auditor, and a certified internal auditor. Jeff has written and had published various white papers and articles and has written two books dealing with the Oracle eBusiness suite. Stephen Coast is the chief technology officer and founder of Integrity Corporation. He has been working with Oracle products since 1994, and for the last 16 years, Steve has focused on the security and auditing aspects of the Oracle eBusiness suite and Oracle databases, and has written and presented on these topics at various national and regional conferences. Steve is recognized internationally for his vast security knowledge and expertise. I'll now turn it over to Steve. Thanks so much, Phil. So today's topic is change management in the Oracle eBusiness suite. And this will be a little different take than probably any other change management Oracle Business Suite presentation you've ever seen, because we're trying to combine both the audit side and the DBA side. So this will be a very unique in terms of giving you a full breadth of how should you be doing change management from start to finish, from both the DBA's perspective, but also the auditor's perspective. So my background is being a DBA and Jeff is a CPA, auditor, CFO. So we bring both unique perspectives to how do you actually manage change within a large e-business suite environment and do it effectively. And so we'll walk through all the aspects of what is a change in Oracle e-business suite and how do you manage that change? What should the process be? How do you make sure at the end of the day that only authorized changes are happening in your Oracle e-business suite environment? Before we get started, a quick background about Integrity. Integrity was founded in 2001 by former Big Six consultants working on large Oracle eBusiness Suite implementations. Uh, back then, security was not being handled at all. People still had the apps password as apps, things like that. So we've come a long way since then. Uh, and Integrity specializes in Oracle eBusiness Suite security. So how do you actually secure the Oracle eBusiness Suite, especially the technology stack, the database, the application server, and the application itself? Uh, Integrity does that a couple of different ways. We do have a product called App Sentry, which validates the security within Oracle Business Suite. So all those things that you should be securing, making sure default passwords are, set, are changed, profile options are changed, that you've got password parameters set appropriately, both at the application and the database level. App Sentry does that in a very repeatable, automated fashion. So it takes a lot of hours out of that audit cycle. For organizations who are running Oracle Business Suite or PeopleSoft on the internet, our product AppDefend is an application firewall. So it provides virtual patching for eBusiness Suite. So if you're not applying the security patches immediately, AppDefend can provide you a way to mitigate those risks with those open security vulnerabilities, as well as provide you protection from zero day security vulnerabilities in eBusiness Suite. A lot of this presentation comes from our services work. So we're on site every single day with Oracle eBusiness Suite customers. I'm actually not on site uh, recently, but doing a lot of remote work with a lot of our clients to actually how do you secure Oracle Business Suite, doing security assessments, working with them on how do you actually achieve SOX compliance, PCI compliance, HIPAA, other terms of compliance and legislative requirements around Oracle Business Suite. And then find also doing security design work, implementing auditing, implementing encryption for their Oracle databases, uh, doing database faults and things like that. And finally, we're backed up by a world-class research team. So Integrity has found more security vulnerabilities in Oracle Business Suite than anyone else out there. We work very closely with Oracle, and we're proactively working with both Oracle and our clients on how do you actually secure Oracle Business Suite? What are the best practices? What, what works well? What doesn't work well? And so we're actively breaking Oracle Business Suite and kind of putting it back together in the most secure fashion we can. So let me turn it over to Jeff and have him do an introduction of ERP Risk Advisors. Yeah, thanks, Steve, and uh, welcome everybody to the webinar as well. Um, ERP Risk Advisors, uh, like like Steve's company, has been around for a long time. Um, founded uh, originally in 2004, but uh, my work predates that to uh, implementing the applications as a client and then doing some 
um, system integrator work prior to forming ERP uh, risk advisors. Uh, we have a product uh, we call ERP Armor, which is um, a set of rules that are that can be used in any technology to test uh, sensitive access and segregate sensitive access risks and segregation duties conflicts. And we're just announcing um, something called ERP Armor Roles, which is a predefined set of best practice roles that can be delivered and implemented in an application environment through um, loading those in your environment and making some small tweaks to them. Uh, so ERP Risk Advisors focuses on um, eBusiness Suite and uh, ERP Cloud. A lot of organizations are moving to ERP Cloud and we cover both of those applications as well. So I'm excited about the topic today. Uh, number one, I always like to present with Steve because we, we combined um, two different perspectives, I think, on the topic. And uh, there's still a tremendous amount of risk uh, from our perspective in organizations um, running eBusiness Suite, um, especially in difficult economic times where organizations are more susceptible to fraud. So look forward to the presentation. As we walk through, we'll start about talk about change management at a very high level, and then we'll start diving into what are changes in the Oracle Business Suite environment. And primarily, changes are done at the application level and the database level. And then finally, we'll finish off with how do you actually make sure that changes are authorized or unauthorized? So how do you actually look at the entire population of changes in the Oracle Business Suite environment and track that, specifically looking at unauthorized changes? So let's start off with a little overview and change management, especially in Oracle Business Suite environment. And I'll turn it back over to Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So uh, the slides we have here just sort of focusing on, on some of the, the guidance coming from the um, audit organization. So I'm not gonna go through these slides because um, I think most, most folks attending the session today will understand the basics of um, what's required for change management. We're gonna obviously cover these things as part of the, uh, the presentation. So we just had the two, two slides here, one from the IIA um, and one from ISACA. Um, and in essence, the, the, the challenge we see organizations is not having a change management process in place, but uh, really evaluating um, what should go through the change management process. And that's a challenge for organizations, um, uh, certainly. And then um, putting the proper monitoring in place. So both of these refer to um, that topic um, overall. And of course, if you wanna uh, review these in more detail. The slides will be made available to you later today. So what is effective change management overall? Um, wh what is being changed? Why it's being changed? When it's being changed? Um, really the, the challenge that um, organizations have is, like I said, uh, scoping what should go through the change management process. Some things are more obvious than others. If it's a object-oriented, you know, code, traditional code development um, should go through change management, certainly patches, um, or upgrades are, are happening as part of the change management process. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more. I, I will talk a little more about the application type of changes, um, looking at security changes, roles and responsibilities, profile options, and uh, and then more of the functional changes. Um, so that what we call configuration changes. Um, so these are some of the questions that uh, we would be asking an organization and and how they're um, evaluating the effectiveness of their change management process. Uh, this is a great slide coming out of the IAA documentation, the Institute of Internal Auditors. Um, this is just a, you know, the cycle of change management from identifying the need for the change, preparing it, migrating it, getting approvals, migrating it, testing it. Um, we typically see a dev test prod move, so it gets developed in a, in a dev environment, gets tested, and, uh, migrated to UAT uh, or a test environment that where UAT happens and then migrated to production. Um, our, our, our best practice approach is that um, we're always trying to segregate the development of a change from the uh, migration of that change to production. And most people think about that in the context of object-oriented changes and, and would say, of course, a developer can't move something to production. Um, but in terms of uh, configuration changes and security changes, we would have the same expectations. And it's, it's really to um, affirm that the person moving into production or restrict the person moving things into production is not the developer and somebody independently of the developer is validating um, the the testing and the approvals that ha need to happen before it goes to chain uh, uh, into production. So you would do that on the um, object-oriented side 
Um, certainly would never give a de developer the ability to move things to production um, on their own. You're not going to give a developer access to production. Um, we expect that same thing on the uh, on the configuration side. Um, so change management metrics. This is just a process maturity from a low level of maturity to a high level of maturity. We're really going to focus on what it what it means to be at the high level, um, which is uh, testing for unauthorized changes, um, making sure the access controls are are restricted to just uh, those that are authorized to make changes to production. Um, certainly, that's we think it's easier to do that for uh, OS and database and server type changes, but a lot of organizations struggle with that at the application tier, um, both in the the migration of um, application the security changes as well as uh, the, the functional configuration changes, things like journal sources and document types and line types. So we're, uh, our, a lot of our practices is, is helping an organization evaluate where they are on the spectrum to go from a low level of maturity to a high level of maturity. Um, so uh, there's three types of controls we look at or uh, related to change controllers, preventive controls, uh, detective controls, and corrective controls. Um, so this is a slide. We, both the Integrity and AP Risk Advisors offers different services in this area. Preventive controls is really focusing on access controls, making sure they're restricted. Um, and uh, both Integrity has and, and us have services in that area. The segregation of duties between development, test, and production is more of a governance issue that it needs to be controlled. Um, and then detective controls is, is putting the right monitoring 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 uh, processes in place to be able to to build what we would call an advanced audit trail. Um, an advanced audit trail is necessary because the org the application of itself doesn't have a, a detailed full audit trail um, of every insert, update, and delete uh, the DML changes, as we would call them, um, to to create a full uh, population from a change management perspective. And we do see a lot more um, scrutiny on this topic, um, and that came partially, to be honest, came from a, a training session I did with the PCOB in 2016, January 2016, where they wanted to understand as a regulator how to better monitor the auditors, and so they have been pushing through um, more higher expectations to the external audit firms, and we don't see it consistently yet, but certainly um, we have seen cases where uh, there have been significant deficiencies and in some cases even material weaknesses where change management doesn't have the population or there's a combination of um, access controls really poorly designed access controls and um, a no detective not not detective and correct corrective controls in place um, so we work with uh, uh, customers and organizations regularly on um, responding to audit findings a last step of change obviously is a corrective the bottom one down here um, and that is reviewing audit logs um, generically the, using the term audit logs is a is audit uh, the full audit trail um, and we are uh, evaluate we would expect organizations to evaluate those things um, trace those back to the change management system to to confirm that there is a ticket and if not then doing root cause, root, root cause analysis and taking corrective actions um, to uh, prevent that from going forward a lot of the times that the application tier is really focused on getting access controls properly uh, defined so that nobody has access to make a change that um, hasn't gone through the change control process. Um, so yeah, EBS, so we talked about the, what, what are the types of changes. We're going to break this up into five different segments. Um, application security changes, application changes like configuration changes and patches. Um, we, we both break up security as a separate layer and to, as a type of change because the process of making security changes and evaluating the impact of those. So for example, if you're going to make a change to a role of responsibility, uh, a menu, a request group, um, those should have an analysis being done as to, to the risks being introduced because of that change. So typically it's a looking for segregation duties within a role of responsibility. Um, looking at uh, whether the role responsibility has the appropriate level of sense of access risks, and then um, also then evaluating what the impact of that change is with people that already have roles or roles or responsibilities assigned to them. So there's the the technology that's necessary, um, which is uh, what we would refer to as SOD and sense of access tools in the marketplace. Um, we can 
help organizations either implement software or we offer um, software, what we call ERP Armor as a service, which is a managed services platform that helps you guys evaluate um, application security changes on a regular basis. So there's two types of changes at the application layer I'll talk about in my section as we continue. And then Steve's gonna talk about the database security changes, patching, and then customizations and development. Um, the key thing, uh, the, the bottom half of the slide talking about is uh, there is no um, default value of this is all the things that should go through the change control process. There's nothing published by Oracle. Um, we do uh, take uh, organizations through what we call a risk assessment process where we sit down with end users and IT users and, and try to make sure that there's an agreement on what should go through the change control process. Generally, you can say things within the setup menu um, should go through the change control process, but there's some cases where the, the types of configurations are, are more functional in nature and don't really need to go through the change control process. Um, and there are some cases where like in the FA um, setup menu, you have the ability to enter and maintain suppliers. So obviously that wouldn't be appropriate to go through the change control process. So that um, type of analysis, um, getting agreement is really important. Uh, that needs to be built into kind of your, your, uh, your governance process related to change management. So now diving into um, the, the topic of application changes in EBS. Uh, the one, first thing that, you know, that people think about in terms of application security changes is the core user security and function security. So users, um, the assignment of users, which isn't, isn't something, the assignment of roles to users isn't, isn't something that goes through the change control process, but there are defined procedures related to it, your user provisioning um, tools. And a lot of organizations do that through uh, system administrator and to some extent assigning roles for user management. Um, so you need to have a audit trail of um, a, the assignment of roles and responsibilities to users that should support your user provisioning control. And then um, that the other things we're, we're listing on here, the roles and roles, responsibilities, menus, sub menus, menu entries, request groups, um, functions, forms, the, and even as Steven's going to, Steve's going to talk about the, uh, the deployment of um, a new, new objects or new, new development to production through um, concurrent programs and executables would certainly be part of that. that and then ultimately when those get deployed, they have to be um, um, assigned to a user so they end up on a, on a request group or a menu at some point. So the thing that uh, we prepared is thinking about the context of what does a change management process look like for these different types of changes. So security changes, um, what are the roles and responsibilities as part of the change management process? And we brought some, brought um, this section, kind of some guidance from the uh, Institute of Internal Auditors, Global Technology Audit Guides, or the GTAG documents as we refer to those. And these are different um, generic type of roles that happen as part of the change management process. You have a requester, preparer, approver, a peer reviewer, an implementer, and a verifier. Um, so as you think about the types of this, the changes that happen, these roles within the change management process need to be defined. So we're gonna walk through these with the different types of changes, um, me on the application side, Steve on the database side and the development side um, using this structure. So, the re so for a security change, the most often the requester, person making the request for that change is the process owner. Um, it, it often gets uh, prepared by the business analyst or your, your functional support team. Um, the approver is certainly the process owner. Uh, the, uh, whenever there's a change to a role of responsibility, the definition of those, the process owner related to those, that module or set of modules um, should review it. And then it should go through the um, IT management slash steering committee process. So um, the, the, the steering committee, um, you know, the, the change control board or the steering committee related to change management is 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 also a very interesting topic. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but it is a challenge for um, organizations to define uh, what goes through the steering committee and, um, you know, security changes, for example, it, it kind of depends upon how systemic, uh, I would say the changes that are that, that, are, that are being introduced. Um, we like to see everything being on, uh, being done in a release fashion to go through the steering committee and be moved in um, systemically or, or 
with controls related to it. And that's not often the case with things like security changes, role and responsibility changes, and the things that we talked about here. Um, and it's often not the changes we talk about the next section on the functional security changes. So the, the steering committee or the change control board is often very focused on what we would call core IT changes, um, you know, servers, network, uh, development objects, this type of thing. But the steering committee really should oversee everything that goes through the change control process. We just don't always see that happening. So sometimes these application type configurations, whether it's security or functional configurations, don't go through the steering committee and really should. Um, Another whole topic that I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but that's just some um, some some comments as we're going through this this particular section. Um, so on the peer review side, there's often not a peer review um, per se. There's not some independently looking at the changes to security, but there is a SOD incentive access type of a review, and that could be done by um, the business analyst, or it could be a separate group, a compliance group, or internal audit group, or somebody's running a running a tool um, and evaluating that. Um, if you don't have a tool, there certainly should be a view uh, of looking at what the changes are and thinking about it from the context of both from a, what security you know, risks are being introduced as well as compliance risks. So there's not a person per se, but sometimes there's a group that works on um, this from a, from a compliance or internal audit perspective. And then the, um, on the implementation side of security, this varies quite a bit. Um, and it's, a lot of organizations haven't thought about what's how do we segregate this? So the, the overall overriding concept is how do we segregate the development of changes from the migration of changes? So the preparer and the implementer should be separate. Um, and what we find a lot of times is the security changes are being moved by the same person that, uh, that developed them and certainly is the case with from, a fu from a functional configuration changes. But there really needs to be a segregation so that um, just like you would in, a, in an object-oriented development um, life cycle, um, if, if testing fails in the, the UAT process, it needs to go back to the development side and, and, and be redocumented or redeveloped. The, the, the real key aspect that we, we see organizations um, fail on is that they're not documenting the changes. So if I think about a, a security, change, security change, if somebody's making a change and, and migrating it, um, they may or may not do good documentation. Um, and this is both, you know, it's a, both a challenge from um, an internal audit perspective or in an external audit perspective. So if I'm coming in as an external auditor, internal auditor reviewing this change and I pull a sample of, of changes and that's, we'll talk about the pop, you know, the population changes, which is a challenge in of itself, but I pull a sample of the changes and I trace it back to a change ticket without detailed documentation as to what change was being implemented, which means, you know, um, the menu was this, I've been adding this something from the menu or deleting something from the menu then it's difficult to, to audit the, you know, the change to see if the change was um, effective, complete and accurate, if you will. So the part of the, the reason why there needs to be a segregation between preparation and implementation is the person that's implementing that um, would implement that in a UAT environment, then implement that in production, and they're going to do it exactly as written in the, uh, the, the source documents or the change uh, the change control documentation, which is often just a series of um, an explanation and screenshots as it relates to things like security changes and, and functional configuration changes. But organizations don't do that, which makes it very difficult to, to evaluate when we're talking about this verification process where somebody um, is taking, you know, there's an IT compliance role or, um, or actually a part of the audit process, both internal audit and external audit. Um, so that's why there needs to be, you know, a segregation between development and migration. And uh, a lot of organizations don't understand why that's so important. Um, the next, the bottom part of this as we go through is expected testing and validation. Um, certainly there should be positive and negative testing by process owner. Often we'll see organizations affirm that the change is made as expected, but they're not doing negative testing to evaluate to make sure that something hasn't the negative impact of that change. Um, and that becomes a challenge. Um, sometimes changes being introduced um, don't get identified, the negative side of it don't get, into, uh, don't get identified. And then I mentioned um, SOD conflicts and sense of access risk testing um, really should happen as part of security changes. 
And then of course, there needs to be a confirmation of changes by the process owner after um, the change is introduced in production. Oops. Um, so on the on the application side or the uh, switching over to the functional configuration side, um, any configuration that has an impact what we call on process design or control design should go through change control. Um, I teach a lot to uh, IT auditor, I teach class to IT auditors. I have been teaching on this topic for, for a long time, for about 15 years. And, um, you know, I always start with uh, the, the introduction of, uh, of the session saying, um, you know, Oracle, all these ERP systems have developed a lot of um, uh, dormant code and, and you're really not making code changes per se by setting configurations. What you're doing is turning on and off code. Um, so it's, it's exactly the same risk that you're trying to, uh, to address when somebody's making code changes. You're, you're, you're changing the way the business process works. You're changing the way controls are designed. So all the functional configurations that have, a, have an impact on process or control design should go through change control. Um, and that uh, often is not the case. So what, what are some examples of things that should go through um, change control from a functional side? So here's, here's a slide. You can look through journal sources, authorization limits, um, the things that you would find often in the, in the uh, setup menus, and then what we call its foundational changes, which is core to all modules. A lot of organizations, as I said, struggle with having a clear definition of what should go through the change control process. Um, so I'm not going to go through this slide. I want to keep uh, keep my, my comments to, to the minimum here and try to give Steve a few minutes to talk through his slides. But um, you can go back and say the, 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 the process of, of these functional configurations has its own flow and ebb and, uh, ebb and, uh, ebb and flow between the requester, preparer, approver. And if you guys have questions as you go through the slides, um, uh, then uh, you can certainly talk through this uh, uh, with us on a, on a separate call. Um, on the patch side, um, there's, it's, you really don't segregate patching uh, the application or database. Uh, DBAs are going um, to prepare and uh, implement that production. Um, so a lot of the, the, the challenge, a lot of the control is in and around the, the, the testing process. Um, and I put some comments here on what would be appropriate level testing for database and server patches versus application patches. So I'm going to turn over uh, this next section to Steve. Uh, we'll recap uh, together later, and I'll be available for Q&A uh, towards the end of the session. So thanks. Thanks, Jeff. So that was talking about the application layer. And so when we talk about changes within an Oracle Business Suite environment, there's both the application layer, but also the database layer. And in an Oracle Business Suite environment, the database layer is as important as the application layer for control because any changes being made at the database layer dramatically impact the application, especially the application controls. So if someone can go in and actually access the database directly, they can directly insert into tables, change code, disable application controls, et cetera. So it's very important to have the change management effective both at the application layer and the database layer. And so at the database layer, the first piece is security changes. So again, when someone can access the database directly, they can do a lot. So any changes done to database security is similar as the application side. So if someone has too many privileges at the database layer, they can circumvent their, even though you may have segregation duties at the application layer perfect for that user, they can do whatever they want. So we often see many accounts with too many privileges at the database layer, which becomes very problematic in an Oracle Business Suite environment. So again, any changes here should be going through change management or your uh, security process, just like you would be doing an application change. If you are updating system privileges roles, those should be going through the same security authorization process as you do for application users. And again, one of the huge problems at the database layer is a lot of this activity is being done by DBAs using generic accounts. The application is running using a generic account. So oftentimes when we're actually even looking at these changes, even if you are capturing them appropriately with auditing and things, you're actually just seeing a sys an account like sys or apps actually making those, these changes and it's very hard to get back to that name DBA. And we'll talk about a little bit more on the auditing and authorized changes, some of the strategies to hopefully get around some of these challenges. So those are the security changes. At the database layer, we also have a lot of different changes going on in terms of database patches being applied. 
DBA is maybe changing initialization parameters, which potentially impact auditing, may impact the stability of the system, may impact performance. So again, all these things need to be going through change management as well as the code object. So a significant part of the database change management will be code object changes. If I'm actually creating tables, new triggers, I'm creating PL SQL code, I'm modifying that PL SQL code, uh, especially for interfaces and things like that, uh, very significant. Again, the problem here is a lot of these changes are happening in the background by generic users. When you actually apply database security patches or even application patches that are updating database objects, when those run, those are typically running as like the apps user or the sys user. And so when you get the audit trail, that's all you'll see. And then to make it even worse is a lot of these changes are also being made by the application itself when it's running. When you've got a process like GL posting, when GL posting runs, it actually dynamically creates database tables. It'll drop those tables when it's done, but when actually you're looking through the object changes in the database, you'll actually see all a bunch of tables created by automated processes that are all done by the apps users. And if you try to track that back to anything, well, there was no change made. The DBA will tell you, I didn't make a change at any time. That was just a background process that just creates tables. Until you can help filter that out, um, it's very hard to discern, okay, what's a real change? What was an automated change? What was actually just an application and doing activities within the database? And then in other cases, when we're talking about patching, a single Oracle eBusiness Suite patch may change a thousand database objects. So you may get massive amounts of changes over a period of time where you can map that back to when the patch was applied, but there's no indicator that, oh, hey, this patch changed this object. Um, so again, the database change management is problematic because there's a lot of challenges around on how do you actually verify what changed, what's my population of changes with, happening within the database. So when we talk about change management, the first thing most people think about is kind of the customizations, the development objects. And in Oracle Business Suite, for those of you not super familiar with the application, who haven't worked with it as a long time like Jeff and I have, customizations are what really what you do to an Oracle Business Suite environment. Um, when you do development, it's really pinpoint development. And it's kind of a thousand pricks of light in terms of you're not building big things. What you're doing is you're building a report here. You're making a customization there. You're actually developing one interface. You may be customizing a form. You may be developing a new report. So there's not typically a large development effort within an Oracle Business Suite context. It tends to be very small snippets. And maybe some may be large. You may be developing a small little bolt-on to the application as a web interface or a set of web pages. That may be 20 or 30 pages, but that would be typically a very large piece of custom development around eBusiness Suite. Typically, it's one form, one report, maybe a couple packages, maybe a couple packages in a table and an interface program. So that tends to be the type of development. And when you're working with the development teams, they tend to have two phrases that they use is CMLI, which is kind of configurations, extensions, modifications, or rights objects, which are reports and conversions and enhancements around it. The challenge here though is on the custom result on an e-business suite is there's many different types. So you can actually do development in the application by just going through the application UI. The DBAs may be using SQL statements to create packages and things. Or, the, or development objects may be putting on the operating system. So changes are being made throughout the application. And one of the big questions we always get is, okay, how's all the different ways you can customize the application? A significant issue and challenge with Oracle Business Suite is there are many different ways I can customize an Oracle Business Suite environment. Oracle Business Suite's model is wide open. It's do what you want with it, flexibility, ease of customization is a hallmark of the application. But those same hallmarks of the application are actually detractors if you're looking at it from a change management auditor's perspective, because yes, you can change just about anything willy nilly and there's no controls around it. Anyone on the call who is familiar with the SAP environment, SAP is much more rigorous, much more structured. In some cases, you actually have to call SAP and ask them for permission to customize some objects in the Oracle Business Suite environment is you can basically make a customization anywhere you want at any time in any way you want. Oracle has recommendations and there are standards and there's better ways to do it. But if someone wants to just grab a piece of code and start making a change to it, 
there's no limitations as long as you have the access to do that. So therefore, that's why when Jeff talked about preventative controls and the access controls are very, very critical in all three business suite environment that you are only allowing those people who should be modifying code objects, making these changes in the application are authorized to do so. And that then you've got the appropriate auditing turned on to see what changes are being made. So this is from Integrity's methodology around customization. So we track different types of customizations in the application. Our App Sentry tool will report on these, and we have a methodology that we actually do review these for security violations and things like that. But as you see, there, this is a wide range. We've got everywhere from concurrent manager programs that some are stored in the database, some are shell scripts stored on the operating system. When we're talking about forms, forms personalizations are actually stored in the database, but I may be actually doing custom forms. I may have a custom PLL. Those are on the operating system. And in some cases, on EBS customizations, when we talk about Oracle Alerts, Jeff and I had a nice discussion about this the other day. When we talk about an Oracle Alert, well, from Integrity's perspective, we view that as a code object because you're actually writing SQL statements going into an Oracle Business Suite form and actually putting that SQL statement in that form. Well, Jeff thinks that of that as a configuration issue because you're actually going into a form and you're actually changing the way the alert works and things like that. Um, so some of these are kind of slight, a gray area is, are they configuration? Are they customization? How do they actually work? Uh, web services are another one that a lot of web services I can configure through the application and the way I enable web services and configure them. Uh, web pages are wide open because there's a large different population of web pages in Oracle Business Suite. Again, Oracle Business Suite is very open, so they actually have seven different web architectures that are available in the application to allow you to make customizations, custom web pages that are presented to users. So there's a very large different ways you can actually do customization. So there's no single way as one enterprise does all this. They may pick and choose. So if we look at this list here, if you talk to any organization, they may have 10 or 15 different ways of actually customized the application. And so you have to have that understanding. Some may be heavily used, so they may have tons of custom reports and tons of custom uh, forms, but just a few custom current manager programs. Other organizations we see, one organization we looked at recently, they had a thousand different concurrent manager programs, like a thousand custom programs that they were doing for different processes. So each organization uses the application differently and how they customize it is very different across organizations. So again, the change management around customizations and development objects tends to be the most mature in the organization. This is the one that people care about because they're doing it in other areas. When you write a custom application, usually the change management is very much more rigorous around that. Therefore, they've taken that change management process from the development aspect and brought it over to eBusiness Suite where the change management tends not to be robust is in the other areas around application configurations, around application security, around database security. But generally, this is at least a little bit better. The problem ha happens in that they tend to cover more of the operating system objects, those that can easily be transferred via files and things like that. So the focus tends to be in on, on that, not necessarily areas like Oracle Alerts, web services changes, and et cetera. Um, and then don't forget all the other changes in Oracle Business Suite environment. So again, we've covered the application layer and the database layer fairly extensively because that's where most of the changes, most of the application controls reside. But again, in an Oracle Business Suite environment, you also have the application server. So you're applying patches there. You're, there's multiple Java stacks. So you're applying those uh, patches. Um, for If you're running like Exadata, Exadata has whole separate patches. Then you're patching the operating system. You've got security, um, et cetera. So, a lot of these are covered now in the infrastructure piece. And again, that should be a little bit more robust. But again, we see some organizations that, oh, they don't know when the last application server patch was applied because they're just doing application patches, but they don't do database patches or application server patches. So again, there's lots of different changes, lots of different upgrades, lots of different pieces of the components uh, with the Norwalk Business Suite environment. So that's looking at the change management process talking about what changes can happen in an Oracle Business Suite environment and how those processes should work, how should you be documenting it, who should be reviewing things. Now the question is, how do you know what the population changes were? What is happening in my Oracle Business Suite environment? How do I know that there's authorized change, which authorized changes happen? But then also, how do I detect if there's unauthorized changes? So it's very critical to have some layers of auditing. And as 
Jeff said, advanced auditing needs to be enabled. The application woefully out of the box does not have any auditing turned on really. So you have to now add on these layers of auditing in order to protect the application and understand what changes are happening within it. Oracle does have a few minor pieces that are turned on. Um, so for many, many records within the Oracle Business Suite database, there is a limited set of who columns. So you know who created a record and who last updated it. The fundamental flaw here is you don't have any history. This is just who created it and who last updated it. So if there was 10 changes between the time it was created to today, I only know about two of them, who created it and actually who last updated it. All that history is actually never recorded within the business suite. But at least gives you a little bit of information here uh, that is helpful. But again, if someone changes it, changes the value to, to something, does something bad, goes changes the value back, you would just know that when they changed it back, you would have no history of what the value was or who actually, what was it before, et cetera. So in order to get more information, you have to be turning on at least some levels of logging. For the Oracle Business Suite, there's a number of different components that actually can do logging. So you can get sign-on audits. So you can actually see who's connected, what responsibilities they use, what forms and functions they access. Um, for the web side, the self-service side, Oracle then has another auditing mechanism called page access tracking. Some modules like HR have date tracking, so they actually have a little bit more information. So you can see all the changes to like salary and it captures that history by default. Those are all more point in time. What we're gonna focus in on around change management is how do I capture the changes to a large set of the application that's configuration oriented, that's the definition of users, that's definition of concurrent manager programs, things that are changing the way the application is configured and operates. And there's really two mechanisms to do that in an Oracle Business Suite environment. The first is the built-in native capability is called EBS audit trails. So this is included with the Oracle EBS license and there's forms with it. So you actually go through and you can configure and pick any Oracle Business Suite table that you want to audit. And this will actually then define triggers and actually do the capture. If you want something more sophisticated that then can centralize that information, report on it much better than the native capability, then you need to purchase a snapshot trigger solution. And those solutions are like Chaosis, FastPass, SafePass, um, Oracle GRC, which is no longer being sold at a trigger level. So that will, those tools will put triggers on different tables. Therefore, you can see all the changes. If you wanna just do a little bit simpler without the expense and time to implement, there's tools like AppSentry and Integrity Cells. There's also another tool called Config Snapshot that will more do a snapshotting. So there are some different options here. How much effort and time and money do you wanna spend will really determine on which tools you rely on and how to actually do this appropriately. For this presentation, we'll actually focus in on the Oracle EBS audit trails. So this is native functionality. So this is fairly well documented within the Oracle documentation. Um, there's my Oracle support notes out there that gives you more information. And what this does is actually creates triggers and shadow tables. So when you make a change to, in this case, I'm making a change to someone's uh, email address, it'll actually then create a second record in another table that actually creates the previous value. So you can go back and recreate the history of a single record and what that, how that record changed by column over time. So this is a very effective, where EBS Audit Trails stops is it captures the data for you, but it doesn't give you the reporting or all that other information that you need. All the, it doesn't create alerts, it doesn't do any kind of reporting. So you have to build that all manually. Um, so that's where some of the commercial tools are helpful because they're giving you the reporting, the alerting, all that capability and functionality is built into those tools where it's not built in natively to Oracle Business Suite. So if you wanna enable EBS Audit Trails, Integrity actually has a white paper out on our website we give away for free. So we actually walk through and say, okay, here's the changes that we think you should be at least tracking and monitoring and give you those tables. And so there's a number of different areas where in terms of security, configuration, customization that you want to be capturing. And so this is just a partial list. Um, this is just a few of the tables that you should be doing. Most organizations, if you want to do this right and complete, you're into 50 to 100 tables that you wanna be auditing, and this is all manual setup. You have to go table by table. Um, it takes quite a bit of time to do that. 
Um, but this is kind of just gives you an idea of here are some of the tables. So in terms of profile options that you're capturing the changes to not only the profile definition, but what those values are. Capture chain, key changes to users and things like that. And again, when we start now expanding this out, that there's many, many tables. And so Jeff talked about some of the configuration controls you have to have to, in order to verify that there's no unauthorized changes to those things like journal sources. Many organizations add in things like bank account numbers. So are people changing bank account numbers? How are addresses changed on my supplier master? Those types of things in order to look for fraud. Uh, so there's many, many tables, and based on how you're using the application, what modules you have installed, will really drive what tables you want to audit. Um, so again, there's no easy answer to this. This is kind of trying to figure it out, going through that risk analysis, and then going through and actually configuring this in the application and trying to get this data somewhere. So a lot of activities happening at the application level, but you also need to be having the database auditing turned on also to, okay, what's happening at the database layer? Who's logging into the database? Who's creating database users? And again, just like the application layer, there's multiple audit trails at the database layer. So depending on what I wanna capture, I may capture it different layers. So I've got privileged users. So the privileged user auditing is a whole separate audit. Um, if I wanna do fine grain auditing, I can actually be very specific on if someone actually enters the transaction onto a table that's over $10,000, I can do that in Oracle Business Suite within the database. But again, I have to custom define all those, create policies, and put that in. And so again, in our framework, Integrity publishes this out, we kind of give you what we think the answer is, at least a starting point. And then you can customize it for the organization, but the idea here is to get you 60 or 80% down the road, say, okay, yeah, we know we should turn at least these on, somebody's defined it out for us, what else do we need on top of it? And very systematically saying, okay, yeah, I need to know who's connecting to the database. All changes to users, changes to roles, changes to the database configuration and those types of things. So these are at least the most important categories about what's happening within the database. And then when I start talking about customizations, how much of a level do I wanna capture in terms of table creation, triggers, packages, those types of things. There are a few features that you can custom build into the application and change the DBA processes to actually make this a little bit easier. So within the Oracle database, I can actually create a small little piece of code. So when my DBAs, if I change their workflow or process and they do certain database activities, I can now capture change ticket numbers. This is one of those features that we feel enough organizations don't implement. And when we set this up for an organization, it's all of a sudden like rocket science. Like they're saying, oh my God, this is the best thing since sliced bread. In terms of now, at the database layer at least, I know changes are mapped to change tickets. So if I change the DBA workflow process a little bit in that before they do a change, so let's say they're creating a user named Scott, they actually run a little piece of code and they type in the ticket number. The database audit trail will then tag that audit trail with that ticket number. And it uses a column called client ID. And then what we do is actually then create reports and like around user creation. So database users should be authorized. I should be able to go back and find an authorization that was appropriately approved and then provide the DBA so that they could then create the account. I can now create reports on user creation that if it has a ticket, I will then now sample those. I don't have to necessarily go through every one, but if I get user creations without a ticket number attached to it, I know something went wrong in the process. Either an automated process created it, a hacker broke in and created that account, or the DBAs weren't following appropriate processes. So this becomes very easy to do it just takes a little bit of implementation effort, a little bit of process change, but again, now I'm making my change management much more effective, my auditing, looking for authorized and unauthorized changes. Um, so if you get one thing out of this presentation at the database level, being a DBA, this is a very powerful thing to do. Again, it takes a little bit of effort because every time you do a change, you gotta type in the ticket number. But again, you can put these in the SQL scripts that run at the top with the change number. It becomes very effective and it's not that hard to do. But again, the output from the auditor's perspective is like, oh my God, this has now changed my life. I'm trying to figure out what's happening in the database because I couldn't figure it out before. Now I, at least I have some information to note to go off of. 
one of the other critical aspects of in terms of auditing is where, what am I going to do with this information? Oracle eBusiness Suite, the database generates this massive amount of audit trails. I need to get it somewhere. I really need to get it out of the database and into a tool. And a lot of organizations have implemented centralized logging tools like Splunk Elasticsearch. Our tool called App Sentry will actually pull this information in also. Now I have a single source of truth. I'm pulling all this information from the database now into a location that where it's protected, it's archived, and I can easily report an alert on it. The challenge here is there's many different audit sources within the EBS environment. So I've got database tables for both the database auditing, for the EBS auditing. I have things on the operating system. I do have to spend some time and effort getting this in, but as soon as you can get into a tool like Splunk, the reporting is incredible that now I can generate easy to do reports, really publish that out. And a lot of organizations have implemented tools like Splunk and Elasticsearch within their organizations. And the amount of data generated by eBusiness Suite is actually isn't that much compared to what you're doing from your routers and your servers and other locations. So this typically is not a high cost solution if you already have these tools in place. So again, a lot of this information is contained in our guide to auditing and logging in the Oracle Business Suite. So, and this framework is available on our website for free because we started doing this for a lot of clients and we really recognize that, hey, everybody needs this. No one knows where to start. And this is an incredible starting point in order to enable auditing and logging in the Oracle Business Suite. So that was a very high level overview, kind of giving a little bit different perspective, both having an auditor and a DBA on the call to walk you through, okay, here's how you should be doing change management. Here's strategies to make it more effective in the Oracle Business Suite environment. And kind of a lot of the questions we always get is, what is the population of changes in Oracle Business Suite? And we tried to answer that. And again, we don't have, there is no correct answer, but we gave you a lot of ideas on, okay, here's all the areas you do, do need to be looking at. And then how do you turn on that auditing and turn in order to actually figure out, are there authorized changes? Are there unauthorized changes in our environment? So what I'll do is now turn it back over to Phil and see if we have any questions. Well, thank you, Steve and, and Jeff, both. Yes, we have a couple of questions that have been submitted. Uh, the first one, what current issues are you seeking with the external auditors, or external audits rather, subject to the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation? So I'll take that one. Um, I think I did comment on this earlier. I think the biggest ch changes we're seeing over the last couple of years is um, really trying to get a source of uh, population of changes that happen throughout the entire um, application, both kind of like the database tier, as, as uh, Steve talked about, as well as the application tier. Um, I, I think that they've been at a higher level of maturity on more of the, the, the technical changes, if you will, although there's definitely some some challenges um, with getting that, that population there, but they've their their procedures are probably more standardized, I would call it, maybe not necessarily complete. Um, but uh, the area we're seeing them focus on a lot more in the last uh, couple of years is the IT application controls. So um, they look in the risk controls matrix, they identify which of those have an IT dependency or what we call IT application controls. And then they're expecting that those changes um, have a population to include as part of their change management testing. So Steve's uh, guide, uh, integrity guide is good um, at kind of the core, the core solutions, the core components. Um, and the, and the, the challenge, like I said, organizations is really kind of rounding that out with um, a lot of the functional configurations. Um, I showed some examples of those on, on the screen, like document types, line types. Um, you know, journal sources um, above and beyond kind of the, the core, like flex field values and those type of things. Um, number one, number number one single most important change control process is gonna be any workflow changes, um, which is done through the, the application, traditionally done through the application workflow admin um, and the configurations related to those. So that's, that's my two cents. We're happy to talk to organizations offline. And if people kind of want feedback on um, from a RCM perspective, which configurations um, uh, are necessary from from a, from a from access controls, who has access to them, and then from a monitoring perspective, we're certainly have a, um, happy to have a quick call and go through that with them. Thank you, Jeff. Next question: How can we identify who has access to SQL forms? Is software necessary? 
Um, so I'll take that one as well. I mean, Steve and I both talk a lot about uh, SQL forms or SQL injection forms, um, and we didn't talk about that in a lot of detail in the, in the webinar, but uh, that is, um, so basically the, the short version of that is there are forms, like Steve talked about, the define alerts form where you, you are putting in a SQL statement and then in, ex in essence, the application as it works executes that SQL statement. So there's there are some forms that allow SQL, direct SQL statements to be entered and executed. Some that allow SQL injection, which you typically think of as uh, embedding a SQL statement within a where clause. And then there are a couple forms that actually allow um, OS packages or operating system scripts to be executed. And there is no um, audit trail um, on the tables related to that. There's no easy way to identify who has access to those. So I, I've written an article on this topic that's been out for a few years. Um, and uh, it's interesting to me that we're not seeing this filter into the, uh, the external audit community more than it is. Um, but to answer the question specifically, you really need to have a, um, an assessment a, a, a tool, um, either purchase a tool or license a tool internally, or we offer an assessment um, process as a managed service to be able to identify who has access to those um, those forms or functions we call sensitive access risks. So next next uh, next question, Phil. <laughs> next question: What controls do you typically put in place for application forms that allow SQL statements, such as that you have described in the webinar? So um, controls. There's two types of controls. You want pre preventive controls, which means um, you want to have roles designed so that only people that are authorized to make changes have access to those. So when we're designing application controls, a lot of times we will define um, a uh, what we call an IT DBA configuration role. So what we like to do is try to aggregate um, all the functions that are being used um, to uh, the DBAs to migrate those. There's, for the most part, most organizations are leaving with, living with some level of risk um, with the DBAs related to using, you know, apps, the app's password or keys to the kingdom. Some organizations do have a password vault and some other things that make it, um, you know, ha have two people having to go in to use highly privileged accounts at the database level, but access controls first and foremost. Um, and then the second side, the second control would be a det det detective control that um, allowed, uh, allows you to uh, uh, verify that those the audit trail, um, which doesn't exist, but you have to build the audit trail, um, can be traced back to make sure that all the, the changes to those forms are approved. All right, and another question, hang on. Does EVS and database auditing cause performance issues? So you wanna talk about you database can... auditing, Steve, and I'll talk about other stuff? Sure. So for most typical auditing, you do have to be careful that it can cause a performance issue. So we always recommend auditing configuration, setup tables, those types of components, um, security changes of database layer, and always avoid whenever possible putting triggers or database audits on transactional tables. So you really don't want every time someone creates an order, having multiple audits turned on on those types of things. So Yes, auditing has a bad history of potentially causing performance issues, but a well-designed audit seldom ever would ever cause a performance issue. So you do have to design it carefully and you will not get a performance issue, but if you design it poorly or you just turn on things randomly, it can cause a performance issue. Yeah, I'll just reiterate, I mean, exactly the same thing on our side. When we're deploying tools, um, we're looking for lower volume configuration and in some cases lower volume or moderate volume master data so if we take a risk-based approach to identify what tables they go on and like steve said he's more of a snapshotting approach approach or a query direct query against the transaction tables and then you're able to deploy triggers or snapshot capabilities on the um, on the master data and configurations here's another question I... It looks like it's for Steve. It says how how is App Century is different from Oracle Audit Vault? Uh, very good question. So Oracle Audit Vault is Oracle's. Think of it as just a data warehouse for audit data. So the tool is really designed for 
having hundreds of databases and funneling the audit trail into those to have a secure repository. What it's not designed for is to handle one application like eBusiness Suite and handle hundreds of tables within that environment where Audit Vault really focuses on mostly the database audit trail. App Sentry's focus much more is to the Oracle eBusiness Suite. So it is very Oracle eBusiness Suite aware. It understands what it's auditing, why it's pulling those audit trails, and it pulls it from the different locations and then presents it to someone in the format that you'd want to actually look at or an Oracle eBusiness Suite environment. So in terms of we, we focus in on application security, we focus in on the configuration tables, um, we're making a lot of enhancements around how do you actually audit 200 configuration tables? And Jeff and I have these conversations all the time. It's like, you've got 200 configuration tables you need to audit. How do you do that? So App Sentry is pulling that data in um, via snapshotting capability into the application and presenting it so you don't have to go look through 200 tables. It's presenting it in a very easy to digest format that shows you immediately what changes are happening in what areas of the application. And then it's also doing the same thing for the database audit trail and trying to map that back to, okay, what's important in the Oracle eBusiness Suite environment. So the key about App Sentry is it's really the only tool out there that is eBusiness Suite specific, really providing you security compliance across the application, both looking at the application, the database, and the application server to make sure the environment's secure, not only from a configuration perspective, but also from an oper operations, transaction, configuration, auditing perspective. Another question, which is similar to the one you asked before, what system overhead is generated when enabling database slash application auditing? So let me talk about this. I know you talked about performance. I, I've actually had a customer when we deployed a trigger-based auditing solution, um, <clears throat> and in general, they do, they do full performance testing before and after. So they have a uh, basically uh, an automated testing tool, um, and then something that's looking at uh, the you know performance of the application and. Um, so they've done that. I have one client that did that because they just wanted to, you know, kind of like the audit mentality, trust but verify. Um, and we saw, I mean, there's always overhead every anytime you put a trigger on a table. But of course, as Steve mentioned, um, there's only overhead to the extent that activity hits that table. I mean, if, if you if you have a trigger on F and D menus table and you never change a menu, then there's no overhead to the system because you know there's no difference. So um, we always um, would recommend that um, clients uh, take a cautious approach, but like as Steve said, as, as long as you're smart about where you're deploying the triggers, there shouldn't be any, audit, any performance issues. And the general rule of thumb that we kind of throw around is it'll be 2% or less. And so, and we go out through, in terms of our integrity auditing and logging framework, we actually go through and tell you what our estimates are for the amount of changes per audit uh, in that, and we actually do that for clients. So. The one thing that we do turn on auditing for is both application logons, forms and functions. That generates a little bit of data, but you can very quickly estimate that by looking at the FND sign-on forms and then also for database sessions. And so we tell you, yeah, there'll be 10,000 database sessions and we're going to audit that because you need to know who's logging in your database. And there's with the native auditing, you can't disable that. But again, we're when we're talking about audit trails here, we're talking about maybe generating 20,000 extra records a day, which is nothing compared to the if you looked at the overall impact of the application what it's doing per day adding 20,000 30,000 audit records per day and mo and then 99% of that is just around sessions and 1% is maybe meaningful data um, it generates no overhead yeah to your point Steve you have to have it anyways you just have to uh, to, um, have the adequate hardware in essence to be able to support it because you, you really shouldn't be running the applications without it Next question. And we very seldom never see that someone needs hardware to do it. Yeah, so yeah go ahead. Uh, that's a good point. We don't either. All right, now the next question. Can you please share one or two questions raised by state slash federal level auditors on EBS Suite? One or two questions uh, specifically on the federal side? State, state slash federal, yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't really see that the applications. I mean, as a, both. I mean, everything we talked about today is really different for a commercial environment versus a federal or government env environment. Um, the only difference is going to be maybe where it's hosted in some cases. Um, so, data, there's some data security 
requirements perhaps we would see at the in a, in a government entity that we may not see in a commercial entity um but you know like rfqs um there's one customer we had that was really cautious about seeing um, rfq data in process that was a government entity but most everything else we've discussed today i don't wouldn't show i wouldn't really identify much of a distinction between a commercial and a company and the government i don't know if steve do you have any thoughts yeah for kind of the federal um and sometimes moving down to the state we'll map some things to fisma nist 853 our the compliance standards are a little bit different but it's the same things that we're looking at um, very seldom do we actually make any changes to the audits it's just kind of what we call them and how we map them back at the end of the day um, but generally financial controls are financial controls and they should be in the same in the federal space as in the enterprise space and security controls may be just a little bit more rigorous so we we'll actually may add in additional layers um, into the uh, government space when we actually implement app sentry all right, thank you, Stephen and, and uh, Jeff. This is going to wrap it up for the day. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending, and also want to say uh, happy birthday to Steve Coast, and a special thank you to uh, Jeff Hare for sharing his expertise. So thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the day. Thanks.